There you go. Okay. All yours. Welcome back, everyone. It's so good to see you. I hope you enjoyed your little break. <laughs> um, uh, so let's just get started and then we'll get right into today's topic. And so start with a prayer. Yo Vishwam Vidadati Pati Satatam Samhara Yatyanjasa Srishtva Divya Mahauschadischa Vividhan Duri Karotyamayan Vibrano Jalana Chakasti Bhuvane Piyusha Purnam Ghatam Tandhanvantari Rupa Misha Mamadam Vandamahe Shreyase Vandamahe Shreyase Vandamahe Shreyase Om Shanti 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 So welcome back. Today we're going to talk about um, Pakshagada or also kind of loosely translated as hemiplegia. And this is actually one of the Vata Vyadis that we talked about. You know, it was, it's in our long list of 80 different Vata Vikaras. And so even though it is mentioned under Vata Vyadi, it's not just purely a vata associated condition. It's primarily vata, but it is also tends to be associated with other factors as well. So why don't we get right into it? And I'm going to share with you, hopefully all of you got the PowerPoint. And I'm just going to share my screen with you so we can go through the presentation. Okay. So, Pakshagada. Pakshagada is, this is a condition that presents with um, paralysis on one side of the body. So, Paksha means uh, half, and also it, all, it means like your limbs, half of your limb, you know, half of your body. And Ghata means that it is blocking or it's constricting. It's not able to move which is very much similar to hemiplegia because it has the exact same meaning and the exact same presentation as well. So in this condition, it presents with paralysis on one side of the body, and that includes the arms, the legs, and also half of the face. So for instance, when we had talked about, um, <coughs> excuse me, when we had talked about Ardita or um, Bell's palsy or sort of half side of your face being paralyzed, that is one condition that is also associated with this. Uh, sometimes in certain cases of Pakshagada, you may not necessarily always have, <coughs> excuse me, you may not always have that presentation of, um, of the paralysis in the face, but for the most part, it tends to happen. Okay, so in Ayurveda, this, as I said, this condition is primarily a Vata condition, but it's not necessarily only vata that's there in the pathogenesis of it. Um, it we also tend to have uh, other factors such as rakta or pitta that's involved. You may also have presentations um, where kapha is involved, and there also may be a situation where ama is involved. So remember when we had talked about over in the weekend where um, vata can aggravate and there, the pathogenesis of vata vyadis can be in two different ways. And not necessarily exclusive to each other, but it can be due to dhatukshaya, where there is a depletion of the dhatus and there's a depletion of the normal nourishment and structure to the body, therefore creating more space and more of a void so vata moves faster. There is also the situation where you have uh, vata avarna, something that is blocking or hindering the movement of vata. So in, for an instance, in this case, you tend to have this situation. In this vyadi, it tends to be even more so on the part of vata avarna or something that is blocking or hindering vata. 
and the movement of vata. And what typically blocks or hinders that movement of vata can be any one of these, either rakta or pitta, or it can be in, state, in cases, um, certain issues with kapha, or it could be ama as well. And as we know that these can, can coat the, the, the channels, the lining of the channels, and that helps, that actually helps to slow down the movement of vata or even block the channels completely where vata can't move at all, okay? So pakshaghata. In Pakshagada Madhava Nidana, which is the um, the textbooks that the textbook that we talked about, that is primarily about pathogenesis and about the Panchanidanas or different factors that cause disease and presentation of disease. Basically, all about pathology. So in that text, they he's described Pakshagada as a disease occurring due to vata, where the vata tends to dry out these siddhas and snayus on half of the body. So siddhas are kind of translated as arteries and snayu is translated as tendons. So this vata tends to be drying out the arteries or tendons in half of the body. And as we go along, you'll start to see what they mean by that, okay? So when this vata dries out these um, arteries and tendons, it can result in loss of stability of the joints so which means the joints don't have as much nourishment and they're not able to move as freely as they were before. It also tends to be associated with pain and loss of speech, which of course we know. Um, and it can be, there can be loss of control and inability of normal functions of the limbs. So when it's associated with pitta or even pitta or rakta, there to there, tends to be an association um, along with burning sensation and an increase of temperature either on the whole of the body or on the affected side. And there may also be, may also be fainting. Now this is not always the case, but it can be there as well, depending on the severity or the intensity of pitta involved in the situation. It can, if it is associated with kapha, the body will tend to be cold. The person tends to be much more on the colder side. It, it's usually associated with swelling and heaviness on the affected side of the body. Okay? So this is why hemiplegia tends to be the closest correlation to pakshagada because it, again, has a very similar presentation. Hemiplegia literally means hemi is half uh, of the body and paralyzed or uh, having a stroke is basically the definition of plegia. So the hemiplegia means, of course, there's paralysis of half side of the body. So hemiparesis is also a similar condition. In, in plegia, it's a, it's a stroke or a paralysis where there is lack of movement completely. Whereas in hemiparesis, it's sort of like a milder version of this condition where there is weakness and partial loss of movement of one side of the body. Now, both of these conditions can be considered as, as pakshagada. In Ayurveda, when we uh, approach these conditions, it, we in both presentations, we would consider it as pakshagada. So whether it is partial loss of movement or complete loss of movement, that would still be considered as pakshagada, okay? So the signs and symptoms that have been indicated for, for hemiplegia are, the major signs and symptoms, the first is loss of motor skills. So that's difficulties in maintaining balance. The person is not able to, to balance their body because of weakness of their limbs. And it tends to be, a, uh, they tend to have a challenge or a difficulty in maneuvering their body weight. Because again, this is due to clear weakness. They're not able to manage what we, if we look at our structure, or our body, we have quite a bit of weight. And our body works in tandem with all of the other structures in order for us to stand upright. So if there is weakness of any of the uh, associated structures, like for instance, the muscles, the nerves, the bones, if there's weakness in that, then it's very difficult for us to first stand upright and then also for us to balance our body or even to move. And in that coordination, because there's a coordination of all of these structures together in order for us to move appropriately. 
So if there is, of course, in this situation or in this condition, there tends to be loss of motor skills, mainly because, again, it's uh, partially the, the siddhas and snayus, which we, again, the arteries and tendons, but also the nervous conduction. Because in certain si situations, siddhas have also been translated as nerves as well, okay? So it's the simple task, that, for instance, um, in this situation, simple tasks like buttoning their, their shirt or putting on socks tends to be really difficult because they, again, that's coordination of the muscles and nerves and the other structures in order to be able to, to complete these fine movements. They're not able to do that with, with this condition. They'll have, um, of course, loss of the ability, body's ability to coordinate the movements um, and that results in, in problems with the body posture and in walking and in balance. So for instance, one of the typical signs of a person who has this condition, they tend to have a circumvate walk, which means that they're, when on the affected side, the, the leg tends to have to, they, it's like they're dragging it. What, if they take a step on the regular side, they're able to take one step forward and that they're able to balance on that one foot. But in order to take a step forward on the side that's affected, the foot is not able to lift up and move in the same mobility as the other side. So what they end up doing is they drag the foot. And how it presents is that the foot will be dragged in a circular motion. So one, on one side, their leg moves forward in a straight manner. And on the other side, the leg goes like a half a circle and then moves forward. So that's known as a circumvate gait, where the leg tends to move uh, towards the side. It's basically because they can't manage that weight and also the coordination. So it's almost like they're dragging that part of their body in order to move forward. Therefore, walking is very difficult in this situation, okay? Um, forcing weight on, Again, this is exactly what it just described. In certain situations, it may be forcing weight on the non-pelagic side, or even there may be situations where they're forcing weight on the pelagic side. Now that again depends on the situation of how much strength or how acute this, the, the onset of this condition is, okay? They may also present with intermittent pain, pain and ability to control their limbs sometimes is better than others. It's not always the same. Of course, other associated symptoms are typical, such as headaches, dysphagia, um, difficulty in speech, slurred speech, which we had seen with the Ardita or the facial palsy or Bell's palsy. They tend to have all of those signs and symptoms associated with the other issues of their uh, motor skills of their limbs, okay? So how does this occur? What, what really causes hemiplegia or what really causes pakshagada? In both situations, it's somewhat of a similar description. So for instance, in, in, from the modern perspective or from the conventional aspect, when they look at strokes, there are different manners or different re ways where a, a stroke can occur. So for instance, if you have a cerebrovascular accident. And what that basically means that there is some disturbance in the flow of blood through the brain, to the brain or through the brain or the actual, um, the structural integrity in that. So sort of like the balance of the, the very intricate balance of blood flow and fluid balance in the brain. Okay, so in both of those conditions, in, in, in these situations, there is either a, a hemorrhage, or for instance, there is um, bleeding in, in this, inside the brain that tends to increase the actual um, pressure within the structures, or there can be a blood clot that travels up from a different place and gets lodged in the brain, or there can be other situations where there is fluid accumulation in the brain due to other traumas. So these are certain um, aspects or certain conditions where these, this sort of presentation may happen. So they are, for instance, different causes for a stroke can be cerebral hemorrhage, as I just mentioned, subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, cerebral thrombosis, 
internal corroded artery thrombosis or stenosis, cerebral embolism, and venous sinus thrombosis. So in all of these conditions, it's either there is a hemorrhage, there is a bleeding within the structure of the brain, or there is something that is blocking the flow of blood or flow of, of fluid uh, in the arteries in, within the brain. So therefore, as you can see, in all of these situations, there is a building of pressure, okay? Other situations where this may occur, again, is a hypertensive encephalopathy, and that basically means that if someone has high blood pressure, and that can increase the actual pressure in the brain due to damaging of the other surrounding structures, they say that um, it's... It, tends to present with severe headaches um, and you, the person says that they start to feel an intense amount of pressure in their cranium or in their head. That's again due to um, hypertension, uncontrolled um, high blood pressure. Okay, or also another situation where there may be a block or there may be an increase of um, pressure or tension in the brain is uh, such as cerebral tumors or acute encephalitis encephalitis. So again, on all of these conditions, basically what's, what's happening is there is some sort of block, okay? And what happens is either due to the swelling or the blood clot or the, the breakage of, of the fine arteries in the brain, that, that accumulation there or that block tends to then stop the nervous conduction from that part of the brain to the other lower parts of where the nerves, the, the, the actual sensory neurons or the, the sensory pathway um, or the neural pathway that's occurring in that particular part of the brain tends to stop because of this block. And therefore, it's not able to then pass through or to be conducted to the lower parts of the body where it's supposed to carry out these particular functions. So exactly where that happens, oh wait, hold on a second. That where that happens is right here. It happens at the pyramidal tracts. Okay, so what is this pyramidal tracts? This pyramidal tracts is a place where there is a joining or where there is a pathway for the corticospinal and the corticobulbar tracts. And so in that, that comprises of upper motor neuron nerves, nerve fibers. And these fibers are basically responsible for your motor functions of the body, okay? So as you can see, movement and the coordination from the brain to the actual movement of muscles occurs in that pathway. Okay, so what the corticobulbar track is basically where the pathways from the cranium to the, the cranial nerves, from the brain to the cranial nerves that actually had, um, tend to control the movements of the face. So the most of the cranial nerves, not all of the cranial nerves, they tend to have the fine movements of the face. So for instance, it's, it affects the eyes and the blinking of your eyes, Oh, it, it's, it's also one of the cranial nerves is responsible for, for um, the olfactory sense or for being able to smell. The other, the facial nerve is one of the cranial nerves which is responsible for movement of the lips as well as movement of the jaw and also coordination of the muscles in that area. So for instance, if there is a block in this pathway, what happens is the facial, all of the facial tendencies and nuances and the fine movements of the face are affected because the pathway of the brain sending these signals to these muscles to do these spine little actions, it's being blocked. It's not passing through, okay? So that's why the half of the face can, can be affected. The other aspect of it is also the corticospinal tract. And in that, it's again the, the pathway of the, um, the neurons and the pathway of the brain signals to the, the spinal nerves. So for instance, the nerves that pass through the, the spinal cord that are basically responsible for motor functions. It's basically responsible for other movements, greater movements of the limbs and the lower part of the body. 
And that's carried out by the corticospinal nerves, okay? And it's responsible for voluntary movement, not for involuntary movement. In your muscles and in, in um, all of these different types of movements and actions that you have, you have two basic types of actions. You have the voluntary movements and the involuntary movements. Voluntary movements are the ones that we control. So that's the one that, for instance, you think, okay, I wanna go for a walk now, or I want to open this book. So when you think you want to open a book, then it, your brain sends these signals to your hand to do that action. And how it does that is it controls your muscles and your muscles tell you to open your hands or to, to hold the book in, in this way and then open the book. Okay, so that is a voluntary action. So the corticospinal nerves, the pathway of how that happens is through the, from the brain through the spine, the nerves that pass through the spinal cord. If again, if that pathway is blocked, it's blocking the voluntary movements. For instance, like moving your hands or moving your legs, okay? And what tends to happen again, it's blocking half of the pathway because as we know in the cranium or in the brain, one half or one side is sort of a mirror image of the other side. And one side tends to be um, that which controls the opposite side, okay? So usually it's one side that's affected that tends to affect the other side of the body. It presents in the other side of the body. Hence, damage to this pyramidal tract causes impairment and loss of voluntary movements of the face and half of the body, okay? So in looking at that, that's how we can see here when in all of these situations or in all of these conditions where you have a block, that's where the block is happening. The block is happening in this pyramidal tr um, tract where it's then affecting the cranial nerves as well as the nerves throughout the spinal tract, spinal column that affects the voluntary movements of our body. Okay? So this is how we look at it. This is the perspective from, from conventional medicine. It's very similar. We're just using different terms in Ayurveda, but we're also looking at the exact same thing. So in Ayurveda, we talk about, for instance, the causative factors. What are the causative factors? What we Basically, everything that we talked about over the weekend, which was a very uh, detailed description of everything that aggravates vata. Okay, so for instance, the different types of ahara or different types of food habits that affect vata and they aggravate vata. So for instance, food that is predominantly katu, tikta, or kashaya rasa, and they, they all, we all know that these are the, the tastes that aggravate vata. So what it does, how it affects vata, or how it aggravates vata is, of course, first because of its composition. Katurasa or um, pungent is comprised of vayu and agni, air and fire. So what that does is that the effects that it produces, it tends to reduce strength. It causes bala kshaya. It also causes brahma or delusion. And it also causes shula or pain. So that, therefore, that tends to aggravate vata, which can present or manifest as dis vata disorders in the arms, legs, in the flanks or the sides, and also in the back. So this is just the general description of how vata will get aggravated. Tikta rasa or bitter is comprised of vayu and akasha. And that also, again, causes more dryness in the body, which again is key to the presentation of how this disease occurs. Um, it also tends to produce karatva or roughness. And vishada means clear. Clear in the sense that it actually helps to um, remove the, the structure or the, the um, stability or the um, nourishment. So for instance, you know if kapha is something that's kapha or something that's very nourishing tends to be more thick and tends to be more viscous in nature. Whereas if it tends to be more clear or more liquidy, then that is less nourishing than the thicker version or the more viscous version. So the, this thicker rasa tends to um, increase these qualities. If it's consumed in excess, it will also cause depletion or shosha of the following dhatus of rasa, rakta, mamsa, meda, asti, and maja. 
So tikta rasa can cause that much of aggravation or that much of depletion in these particular dhatus. Okay? Kashaya rasa or astringent is basically comprised of vayu and prithvi. So here you can see again why all three of these rasas aggravate vata is because they all are composed of vayu or of air plus another another um, element. And Tikta rasa is having the same composition of vata itself. That's why it tends to completely aggravate vata and it, it tends to completely reduce all sort of nourishment in the body. So this kashaya rasa or astringent when consumed uh, excessively produces karatva again, roughness, vishada, clear, clear uh, in fluid basically, uh, and ruksha, more amount of dryness. And that obviously will increase vata and can produce vata vikritis such as pakshagata or ardita or hemiplegia and Bell's palsy. Okay, so this is the actual description um, when putting it all together of how this how the ahara really helps in the pathogenesis of this condition. And as you can see, as described earlier, it causes dryness of the sira and snayus. Okay, so also not just the food that we're consuming, but the manner in which we consume food. For instance, if we're taking less quantity of food or irregular consumption of food or less consumption of food, all of these actually reduces, again, bala or strength. It reduces complexion of varna. It also here, it reduces virya. Virya here means stamina, okay? So in the context of where it's being used, the term virya here means stamina. So by, by consuming food in this manner, in this habit, it can actually reduce all of the things that actually help to produce structure and nourishment in the body. It also impairs sada. Sada we know as the essence of particular dhatus. So you can consider that as sort of like a healthy physique. Um, it also tends to reduce the, the actual bulk of the body or sharira. It reduces the, the qualities of the mind, the healthy qualities of the mind. And so, for instance, you ever notice if somebody's really hungry, they tend to get angry. Or if they are really depleted, they tend to be completely uh, non-complacent. They're not able to concentrate. They're not able to engage in conversation. So lack of proper nourishment will also affect the mind. Okay, obviously it will also affect the buddhi or the intellect and the ability to, um, to recollect um, the sort of information and knowledge that you do have. And we talked about this again over the weekend. Um, and it also will affect the indriyas, the sensory and the motor organs, okay? Hence, that's how it ends up causing the 80 types of vata vyadis, and also it helps to, uh, specifically in this condition, will help to um, produce pakshagada, okay? The other aspects of causative factors that they've specifically mentioned is excess, of course, excess exercise, excessive sexual activity and staying awake at night. Now, these are all factors that we know will aggravate vata. And the reason why it's specific in this situation is because all of these, all of these activities also induce more dryness in the body. Hence, re relating to or adding to the pathogenesis of this condition. Other factors that we do know that affect the mind so psychological factors that can also um, cause this condition, such as kama, too much of desires. And we would think, okay, what does that mean if you have too much of desires? It means that you're taking on too much. For instance, you want to achieve this and you want to achieve that and you want to achieve that. But if you're taking on too much, what again that does is that aggravates vata because you're trying to do too much, okay? Krodha, anger, that also can aggravate vata because if you're angry, what that does is that causes the mind to move much faster. And remember, we talked about the close relationship between the mind and vata. So the faster the mind is moving, the faster vata is also going to move. Okay? Bhaya, fear or anxiety. 
Fear, anxiety, same thing. It causes, again, the mind to move in a very sporadic way, not in a particular low, but very irregular. Therefore, also causing vata to move very irregular, not at a steady pace and rhythm, but very irregular. Therefore, again, aggravating vata. And chinta, which is stress or worrying, again, excessive movement of the mind, therefore excessive movement of vata. So as you can see here, all of that, all of these individually aggravate vata. They also tend to aggravate the mind by causing racing of the mind, therefore again aggravating vata. And also it affects the way our food is digested. Remember we were talking about how our emotions affect how our food is digested. So not only does it directly aggravate vata, but indirectly also it's still aggravating vata. In, the, in this manner that it affects the way our food is digested, it can lead to ama because this, this is one of the causative factors for ama. And what that does is when ama is produced, it then tends to coat the channels and block the channels. So therefore, it is causing shrota roda or avarna avata, or that blocking, hindering avata, therefore aggravating vata, or therefore causing vata vridhi. Okay? So as you can see here, all of these causative factors of nidanas, how they play a part in manifesting as pakshagada. So in, in Ayurveda also, we accept the fact that in this situation, it is a block in the shrotas in the brain. That's where it is manifesting from. So Pakshagada all this also does manifest from a block in this particular area. So though they have not said it in, in the Sanskrit text, they have not said that it is a block in this particular shrotas. It's supposed to be understood by the presentation of what's happening. Because you can tell that, of course, the, the management or the movement of the body and the movement of, of the different parts of, of your body, your different limbs, your hands, your legs, the, the movement of the mouth and blinking of your eyes, all of these things are controlled by the brain. So therefore, if these are affected, then of course it is with that shrotas that is being blocked and therefore vata is not moving. So therefore, you're, you won't have that proper motor function, okay? So as we talked about the pathogenesis of how this occurs. And the clinical features. So the clinical features we briefly described uh, according to Ayurveda um, earlier. And they've also mentioned here the clinical features for hemiplegia or at post-stroke, what happens after a stroke or when somebody has a stroke. They tend to have the following features. If there's a unilateral loss of voluntary power in the affected arm, leg, and lower part of the face. So again, remember we were talking about the voluntary movements. So there is a unilateral loss of that voluntary movement or the ability to move those limbs. There's also this cardinal sign that you tend to find with a clasping knife type of spasticity. So this picture here of someone's hand, it looks like, for instance, have you ever seen those flip knives? And they tend to be sort of at a 90 degree angle and they close down. So their hands tend to, to actually cre create that sort of similar um, structure where it's, spast it's spastic, it, the muscles are not as flexible and as um, fluid as they were before. So for instance, they are harder and dried. This is what they meant in Ayurveda, that the, the, the sira and snayus become dry. So here's a great description of exactly what's, what, what they're describing, is that the, the tendons and the muscles are actually dried. So when they dry, they tend to shrivel up. They're not as elastic as they were before. So what they do is they tend to become hard you not not flex as easily so this this um, particular presentation of the hands clasping and moving inwards and in a very tight contracted manner is one of the features of um, hemiplegia okay and also we tend to find this a lot in pakshagada
Also, you find in certain cases, again, depending on the severity, you can have uh, the tongue is protruded towards the paralyzed side because the tongue itself is actually a, a, a very muscular organ. It's, it's, it's highly muscular. So if the muscles aren't, again, elastic, intense, and contracted in the manner they should be, they tend to be flaccid. And so in the aspect, in the side that it's flaccid, that there isn't proper nervous conduction to keep it in the integrity or or the structure it should be, then it tends to be flaccid, so it pops to the side that is affected, okay? The upper limbs uh, flexed at the elbows and wrist and forearms slightly pronated. So you find, just like you have the presentation of the hand here and the spasticity here, you also tend to find that in the upper limbs moving inwards, they tend to be moving inwards towards the center of the body and they tend to be flexed upwards, okay? And also you tend to find similar presentation with the legs as well. So the, the legs or the, the legs and the feet to be pointed inwards as, and the, um, the, the heels tend to be pointed outwards. So the, the toes inwards and the heels outwards. So it's, again, it's a, if you see the, the, the musculature that is responsible for keeping your legs straight, those same muscles and tendons, when they become contracted or stiff or hardened, then that's what causes it to shift in that manner. And it produces, again, that same presentation. So as you can see here, the more we look at the details of how this is occurring and how it is presenting, we can see that what when they meant and um, when they described that it's hardening or drying of the the sidas and snayus or the um, arteries and tendons, the tendons drying and becoming non-elastic is what causes that deformation. Okay, there'll also be movement of the hands and limbs are more affected than those in the upper arm. So um, you find that the the hands and the forearms is, are much more affected and they're much more um, spastic than the upper arm because the upper arm tends to have a little bit more musculature and a little bit more fat to support that not so, not so much of spasticity or stiffening than the lower parts of the arm, okay? So the investigations, what typically, if you have a client who comes to you with this, or if someone does have a stroke, what are the investigations that we that they typically would do in this situation? They usually do um, a hematology report to look at hemoglobin and the WBC profile and to look at any changes in the blood. Because for instance, in again, as we saw, in, this, in the pathogenesis of this and the causative factors, they do tend to be related to heart disease, to high blood pressure. They do tend to be related to other um, pre-existing conditions. So that's why it's very common to have these sort of investigations done also. They'll also do a lipid profile to check cholesterol, of course, because again, looking at it from the modern perspective, of cholesterol and, and that blocking the arteries, and that could be what has caused, what has dislodged and traveled up to the brain and therefore causing a block. Or also that which is affecting the heart and affecting the valves of the heart, okay? There is also ideally, the ideal investigation that, that should be done in this situation is a CT scan or an MRI of the brain. And the reason why they want to do that is they want to check for hemorrhage because, of course, in most cases of stroke, there is some form of hemorrhage or some form of fluid accumulation or, of course, the, black, the block in the um, pyramidal tracts that we just talked about. Doppler studies of the neck, the reason they look for that is because if there is an injury to the neck, uh, there is an injury to the arteries in the neck, that also can cause, in the injury of that can cause blood clots, and those clots can very easily travel up to the brain. So that's, that's another reason why they might want to check to see if there has, there's any indication of any injury here, and that's what is causing this situation. Also to indicate how severe, how acute the situation is, and, and what they need to do to treat it. Um, 
Also, they, will, they can do examinations of the CF, CSF, which is the cerebrospinal fluid, again, to check and see if there is, um, if there is hemorrhage or there is actual encephalopathy, if, if um, there is an increase in the actual intracranial pressure or the fluid balance, and that tends to happen, again, if there is an infection that is causing the fluid to accumulate in the brain, they will check that and they'll be able to find that out with the CSF examination, okay? They can do x-rays of the spine to check for, again, for fluid, for any block in, in um, or anything that is compressing the spinal nerves, if that is a reason. Also, to help for differential diagnosis, if it surely is because of a stroke, or if it's because of something else. Sometimes when there are very minor strokes, it's, it's very hard for, for you to understand that it's because of the stroke that the person is presenting with the situation, or if it's due to something else, due to just nerve compression, that they're, they're presenting with this inability to move. So for a differential diagnosis, they may do investigations like that. And of course, they'll do an EKG or an ECG to check for heart health, okay? And what are some of the typical um, prescriptions or ways they may um, uh, treat this? So you may find clients coming in with uh, these various different types of medication or treatment that has been advised for them. So for instance, um, they may be put on um, nemodipine, which tends, tends to prevent um, artery spasms. So for instance, if someone has had a stroke, this is a typical um, type of, of medicine that they may be on. Um, they may be also put on medicines to control blood pre their blood pressure, of course, and uh, higher grade that because for, for the most part, in almost 60% of the cases where people have strokes, it tends to be because of hypertension, either hypertension related to issues with their heart or hypertension otherwise due to cholesterol or some of the other factors that can cause hypertension, okay? They may also be put on anti-seizure meds like um, dilatinin or Dilantin, Dilantin. Uh, they may also be put on painkillers or certain anti-anxiety meds, and of course, they'll be put on, on stool softeners. In certain situations where there is a lot of fluid accumulation or too much of hemorrhage in the brain, they may also even be advised by their physicians for surgery. And the, surg the surgical interventions are aimed at trying to drain the blood or drain the fluid so that it can reduce the intracranial pressure, okay? So this is an example of what you would see for a CT scan uh, or a CT scan and an MRI. The, the one on the left is a CT scan and the, one, the two on the right is um, an MRI. And basically what these are going to be looking for again here is some form of accumulation or block. And what you can see, the darker shades is what indicates that there is either a hemorrhage or there is a fluid accumulation there. So as you can see here in all of these pictures, especially those which are circled, it's again indicating that there is a, a fluid accumulation, there either either a hemorrhage or, in, um, um, or an inflammation of other fluids that, that tends to accumulate, like for instance, where the cerebrospinal fluid is being produced, that also helps to fight infection. So if there is an infection in the brain, the cerebrospinal fluids tend to accumulate there to help to fight that infection. So that's where it may, again, increase the intracranial pressure. So when they do these tests, this is kind of what they're looking for. And as you can see here, it's again indicative exactly at the place what we talked about with the um, pyramidal tracts. So that's right here, this is one aspect of the pyramidal tract, looking from the um, superior position. So this is, this is one indicator here. Again, this is, again, indicators. This here is indirect at the top of the thalamus where there is um, uh, fluid accumulation. Okay, oh wait, yeah, let me just, I'll get to your questions in a minute because we're almost through with this aspect of it. So this is kind of what they look at for investigations of this particular condition, okay? 
So from looking at that now, now keeping in mind again, it is an accumulation in the brain that is stopping the flow of vata. That is our perspective from, from Ayurveda we're looking at because we know that nervous disorders and the nervous system is again basically controlled by vata. All movement is controlled by vata. So in this situation, specifically they have said that the, the Chikitsa Sutra, or the line of treatment for this, is Swedana Sneha Samyukta. And what that means that it, you want to do Swedana with some form of Sneha. With, it shouldn't just be just, um, just steam alone, but it should be something always along with some form of moisture or some form of Sneha. Okay? And then you want to uh, advise Virechana. Okay, so we need to do sneha, sweda, and we need to do virechana. These, this is the ideal treatment for, for um, this condition. So you would think again, if it is a vata condition, why don't we want to do vasti? The reason why we don't want to do vasti is because again here, if you're looking at it, where it is situated, it is situated in the brain. And it's most likely, for the most part, tends to be a, an issue with rakta with rakta, with the fluid balance, with the, the hemorrhage part. So if it is a hemorrhage part, virechana is the best. In other situations also, virechana does help. The reason why is because this helps to drain the fluid. So just as they would do in conventional medicine where they would go in to do a surgery to drain the fluid, in Ayurveda, we're doing the exact same thing by doing virechana. So the type of virechana dravyas or the type of virechana herbs that we use to induce that purgation, it's basically not just purgating from the GIT, but it is basically bringing in all of the fluids to the GIT so we are flushing it out. And the manner in which we do this is we're flushing it out slowly every day. It's not just a one-time virechana, but it is actually a slow nitya virechana, which we, again, we had talked about over the weekend, where you're doing it on a slow process of daily trying to reduce the amount of pressure. So that in, it, in that perspective, you're again doing the draining, you're again getting out that pressure, getting out that excess fluid, but also helping to pacify the doshas in the same time. Because if you look at the direction of the virechana, it is still anulomana. It's still causing the vata to move in the downward direction. So therefore, this is still ideal for this situation. So what do we do for the line of treatment here? The line of treatment, of course, we need to do snehana. And we had talked about the different types of oils. So here you can, they can do exactly the same thing. Use either Maha Narayana oil because that is a very good oil in pacifying vata. Now remember when you're checking Maha Narayana oil, it has a lot of ingredients and it is a very, very long uh, list of ingredients. It's a very strong smelling oil. Um, so just be careful that you, it has a specific reference for where they got that formula because Maha Narayan oil is a classical formula. Therefore, it has to have a classical reference, okay? And it should smell. It should be very dark brown in color and it should have a very strong, strong fragrance because they, they are medicating it with a lot of herbs. I think that the... the um, one of the, the recipes for Mahanarayan oil that I found in Bhava Prakasha has over, um, over 80 ingredients in it. So it's a pretty extensive, um, um, pretty worked oil, okay? Also, you can use Sahajaradi oil, which we had talked about, and why Sahajaradi works very well in this situation because it does tend to target... Um, it tends to target um, motor functions. It tends to target uh, um, uh, neurological health. Uh, it tends to help to nourish the nerves as well as induce proper nervous conduction. It tends to work more so on the lower limbs, but it can also work on the upper limbs as well. Okay, Dhanvantara uh, Tela, because that is ideal in general, to pacify vata all over the body. 
So that's another very good choice. And Kshira Bala because that helps to nourish the Vata. So for instance, in the beginning stages, in, in the first stages of if you're doing Sneha, you might want to choose something like either Mahanarayana or Sahajaradi or Dhanvantra. At the end stages, when you, you've already gone through this and you want to go back and again do something that is Rasayana or helping to rejuvenate back the body after the end of this particular aspect of the treatment, then again, you can do Kshira Bala to apply externally. Okay? The aspects of Swedana, how, do, how to do Swedana, which type of Swedana is indicated for this condition, uh, that's the last two on this list. It's Shashtika Shali Pinda Sweda. That is another type of Pinda Sweda or a type of poultice where they make the poultice out of rice that is cooked with a uh, decoction of bala and also cooked with milk. So it basically comes out like a rice pudding almost. It's, um, it's very thick and it's uh, very nourishing. And this, um, this is cooked and then made into a poultice and then that those poultices are heated again in milk and bala kashaya. And that's, again, that's applied to the body. Um, for inducing sweat. Okay, so this is a very nourishing type of Swedana. It's obviously very snigta because of the, the ingredients that are there. And it also helps to, again, what, what this really does is it tends to produce, to give that nourishment to the muscles and to the tendons and to reduce that spasticity and reduce the, uh, the amount of rigidity that is created in the muscles. And this, usually what happens is if you have a client or a patient who has had a stroke and they had a stroke a long time ago, but they still have this paralysis for a very long period of time, the longer the muscles stay inactive, the more tense and the more rigid they become. So the more rigid they are, the more time it will take for us to be able to loosen that up, to be able to re-nourish them and regenerate them. So that's why this is an ideal treatment for, for these sort of conditions. And we've seen, I've seen quite a bit of these cases in India where there are more chronic standing patients who've, who've had a stroke and who are paralyzed after their stroke. So um, in that situation, this works really well. Okay. Otherwise, if it is a, of a recent onset and not as chronic, you can do just a regular type of steam, um, a sarvanga sweda. Sarvanga sweda it basically means sweating that is done on the whole body. So different methods to do sarvanga sweda or sweating swedana for the whole body is such as putting them on a steam tent or a steam room, or application of steam, like for instance, you dip a towel in, in hot water and you apply the steam to the body, that all of these can be considered as different methods for applying Swetana. Usually what you want to do is, even in the steam, the steam should be something that is with milk. So you put milk with water and you steam. You, you, you boil that and create that as the steam. Because what that milk is going to do is that it's going to add that added effect of the sneha. So we still want to do swedana, but swedana with some sneha. So for instance, if you're doing the steam tent, put some milk and water and have that boiling and then have that steam um, go into the tent. So that that's a, a sneha swedana, okay? Or if they're in a steam room, have, you know, where the, the, the apparatus that is giving off the steam, add a little bit of, of either milk or oil, have them apply the oil, you know, be drenched in oil before they go in. So that would, again, keep that sneha factor in there. Okay, so this is the preparatory stage. And ideally, what would the sneha and Swedena is doing is... Of course, the sneha, which we all know by now, but just to reiterate, the snehana is basically lubricating the whole body. Okay, so in this process of lubrication, it helps to, again, reduce the dryness, which is one of the causative factors for this condition, but also it helps to reduce the, reduce the rigidity of the muscles and also to, to lubricate all of the channels. So what we're doing by lubricating all of the channels is we're allowing things to move easily. 
So when we lubricate it and then add heat or then add swedhana, that again is um, dilating the channels, dilating the shrotas, so that whatever is stuck can then start to move easily. Okay, so that includes moving what is stuck in the brain, moving, getting that fluid to move out, as well as getting the nervous conduction and the vata to be able to then move freely. So that even the muscles can move, they can become less tense and start to move better. So in all aspects, the sneha and swedhana helps from all perspectives of the symptoms and the pathogenesis of this condition. Okay, so virechana is some one sort of the last aspect of what we really want to do to address the actual disease itself. Um, so different methods of how you can induce virechana, very easy, very simple things. You can do castor oil, so around 10 to 20 ml of castor oil with milk at bedtime. That's a, a good way to induce virechana. Uh, or you can use katuki, which is pycoriza kuro. Um, five grams of that that's mixed with one teaspoon of castor oil. And that's, again, taken at bedtime. That's a very good um, method of inducing virechana. Or you can even use haritaki. Haritaki, terminalia chebula. That is a, it's a natural um, virechania drug. It's a natural purgative, very good purgative. So you take 10 grams of that and make it into a decoction. So you take 10 grams and then you take around, let's see, I think it's four cups of water and you reduce it to one cup of water and then you can take that decoction. Okay, let me just double check the, the proportions for that. But I, I think that's roughly around how much it, it comes up to be. So you make a decoction of haritaki and that, that can be taken to induce Okay. So in all of these aspects, this is, again, for the purpose of lubricating and dilating the channels and then flushing out, flushing out everything. So that helps to then disperse, reduce the fluid retention, get the vata moving downwards, and also to pro provide nourishment and stability to all the structures that have been depleted. Okay? So after that is done, the next part of, of the treatment is basically then rejuvenation. What you need to then do is help to start rebuilding the structures and re start to rebuild the tissues and rebuild the dhatus. So what you can do is you can do nasya with, with Kshitabala 101. That's, it's um, produced or, or manufactured or processed 101 times. And Chitabala, remember I told you, was a brimhana type of oil, or it is a rejuvenative type of oil. It is a nourishing type of oil. So in this aspect of it, we're doing it for the purpose of nourishment, not for the purpose of shodhana, but we're doing it for to re-nourish the brain, to re-nourish the other structures, also the cranial nerves for the face. Because remember, these, these nerves have also been affected. So the best way to to address those or the best way to reach that is actually through nasya. So we do Kshita Bala 101, um, eight drops in each nostril, okay? Uh, another aspect of being able to re-nourish or to do brimhana or rejuvenation for the brain and for the structures, for the cranial nerves and the structures that are coming out from there, um, you can do shirodhara. There are actually two aspects of how to do this. We can do either shirodhara or shirobasti. So if those of you who have seen the pictures of that sort of cap that they make on their head, that is a shirobasti. Just like you make a basti or just like you make um, the oil wells for the back or for the neck, similarly, they make a well for the head. And what they do is they use that same sort of um, dough around the head, but instead of making a dough well, to that dough they stick a plastic, um, a surgical plastic um, sort of round, they make a round around the head so it looks like a big cap. And then that's again that the ends are sealed with the dough. And in on the on the scalp, we pour in around two angulas. So you measure from the top of their head around this much of oil should be there. So that much is filled in that cap. 
and they're allowed to sit with that oil for around 30 to 40 minutes. That is known as shirovasti. That's a bit of a hard situation to do. So an easier one is you can do shirodhara, which will produce a similar effect. So you can do shirodhara with the, some, with the same oils for the purpose of brahmana or for the purpose of rasayana. So we want to do, we can use narayana oil, we can use kshirabala again, or we can use dhanvantra oil, okay? Other aspects of how other uh, herbs that are indicated in this condition, if you don't want, if you can't do all of these, but other things that will really help and work. Ashwagandha is, uh, is a great combination to use in this condition, because again here, it tends to um, pacify vata. It is very nourishing. And also ashwagandha tends to increase circulation. So it may, it's a much milder version of what we talked about, but it will achieve the same purpose of being able to address all of the conditions as well as help to flush out and reduce the fluid retention that is occurring in the brain. The, the, the rate at which this will work as opposed to the other procedures is much slower, but if you can't do those other procedure, procedures, then at least you have the option of you, using ashwagandha. Or you can, so you can use ashwagandha as a decoction. It tends to work much better as a decoction. Or you can, you can take, um, use brahmi. Brahmi also has a similar action, but brahmi should be used as a decoction as well. Uh, other herbs that, that work very well with this, of course, castor oil, because castor oil really does have the ideal activity for this. Pacifying vata, it is virechaniya, it is purgative, it, um, it is lubricating, and it is hot in potency. It also causes dilation of the, the channels. So in, in this one herb, in this one aspect, you're able to achieve all of the things that we would have done with the treatment. Again, this is much milder, but it will still do have the same sort of pharmaceutical activity as the other procedures that we described, okay? And this is another indication for where you would want to use your garlic milk, okay? Because garlic milk will also have the same activity. So if you don't want to do all the other stuff, you want to do an easier one um, with your clients, or you can have them make, make it at home, they can use the garlic milk. Okay, so other formulations that we typically use for this, um, this condition, and I just wanted to give you the formulations here, the names of them. We have talked about some of them. Um, if we want, maybe we can talk about a couple of them, a couple others. But, you know, at least for you to be familiar with um, Gandharva study, at least, that it is used for an, an array of vata conditions and even in a very severe condition like Pakshagada or hemiplegia, even then also um, Gandharva Hastadi works very well because again it it really it looks addresses all the issues in this pathogenesis. And Gandharva Hastadi, the main ingredient, Gandharva Hasta is castor. So the main ingredient in this um, formula is castor. Okay, that's why it is ideal in these vata conditions. So Gandharva study is a very good uh, formula to use. Other formulas are again Sahajaradi, similar action as Sahajaradi Taila. Maharasnadi, Rasna, remember we talked about this being a very good analgesic and it really is ideal for vata conditions as well. So Maharasnadi Kashayam is a great um, combination. Tiktaka kashaya because it, now you'd say tiktaka kashaya, you immediately think tikta rasa. Why are we using tiktaka rasa in this? Tiktaka kashaya is not only tikta rasa. It is a tikta predominant um, ingredients, but it has a whole bunch of other ingredients as well. And the way this works is it actually, it addresses, it works specifically in um, Conditions of Pakshagada that involves Rakta and Pitta. When you have these two conditions, Tiktaka Kashaya works better. Because if you remember, Tikta Rasa is one of the Rasas that help to pacify Pitta. So therefore, if you have Pitta or Rakta that is blocking Vata, then Tiktaka is actually the better, the better choice 
for uh, for this particular condition because it helps to remove or pacify the thing that is blocking vata. And once you get rid of that thing that is blocking vata, vata will naturally start to flow and help to correct itself. Okay. Other con other formulas: Brahmivati, Brahmivati um, Chandra Prabhavati. Brahmivati is a um, it's a pill or a tablet that is made out of Brahmi and a few other herbs. Chandra Prabhavati is a, it's a gugulu preparation. It's made out of gugulu and um, and again some other herbs, but it is very good in pacifying vata and also it's very good in inducing fluid balance because ideally this is a a, um, a formula that was indicated for urinary disorders so what it does is it helps to again flush out the excess amount of fluid in the body so this works really well along with the gugulu that is anti-inflammatory and that also helps to pacify vata uh, other formulas is Tario dashanga gugulu Bala Arishta. Arishtas are um, alcoholic preparations. So Bala Arishta is an alcoholic preparation of Bala. Uh, Ashwagandha Arishta is an alcoholic preparation of Ashwagandha. And those are really good because uh, the alcoholic preparations tend to be very, they tend to absorb very quickly. So for instance, if someone um, is not able to eat or they have this dysphasia, or you know they have this trouble chewing and swallowing, and they're not able to get the nutrition, but they need a lot of strength. They have no strength at all. Then bala arishta or ashwagandha arishta is a great option because it's a fluid that we can easily help them to administer to get them to swallow, and that will um, that will immediately bring back their strength. Okay, so these are different options um, for the formulas and treatments. Okay, so let me look at some of the questions here that we have. Would cerebral palsy be stroke when child's in the womb? Yes, actually it is kind of a stroke and that even that is um, mentioned in classical texts. They have mentioned that if this is occurring in, in pregnant women or in children, in those situations, it is very difficult to cure, and we should not actually take on those cases because those are considered as asadia. So they've said here, for if it is seen in pregnant women or women who recently delivered, if it's seen in children or um, people who are very elderly in the sense that if they are um, over 80, um, if they're very emaciated or if they have heavy bleeding, then in those cases, we, we cannot um, really induce much of a change. So we should not attempt to treat them because there isn't much that we can do. Okay, so those are considered as asadia cases. But thank you, that was a great question. Um, I have two clients who are hemiplegias and were born with this condition. This is actually quite common. So it, if they're born with this condition, again, they're, they fall under this category that it's very difficult to manage them. Um, if they're, depending on the severity of their symptoms and how bad it is, maybe they can benefit a little bit from some amount of vata pacifying um, treatments, but it, it also to keep in mind that they were born with this, it, it does kind of give us the, our scope of practice and there isn't much that we can do. We can maybe try to help them manage it, but for the most part, you know, also keep in mind that this is a very long-standing um, condition for them and we probably may not be able to do much in that situation but thank you that's a great example of where you know where we can really intervene and where we can't okay so um before you know we still have some time and i wanted to share a case study with you because i actually have a case that even though she doesn't really present as a typical person who had a stroke and has this condition, she has all the signs and symptoms of Pakshagata. 
but a very mild version of Pakshadat. So I just want to um, share this with you, okay? So she's 61, and um, she came in with um, pain on the right side of her body. She said she has pain on her right leg for, for the past one month, and she also has pain um, in her shoulders, and she has pain radiating down her right arm. Um, and she also says that she feels like there's a pressure in her head. She feels like she's been getting headaches and she feels like there's too much amount of pressure in her brain. That was exactly her words. Um, she has reoccurrent UTIs and she's had that reoccurrent UTIs for the past two years or so. And, um, sometimes it's very difficult for her to pass urine, um, and if she does, sometimes when she's passing, it can even be associated with blood. Um, so she said she feels that pressure in her brain. And where she pointed to was exactly here in the frontal region. She didn't, uh, or in the parietal region. She didn't say it was in the back or in the front, but it was right here. Okay. Um, she used to have asthma um, in her, when she was in her 30s. Um, and, but now it's gone away. She doesn't have asthma anymore. Um, she used to have arthritis in her neck around 10 years ago, and she used to feel a tingling sensation in her face and in her eyes, but it would happen only during the night, and that also went away. Okay. Um, she used to have high cholesterol, but she's been treated for that and now it's under control. Okay, and she was taking, currently her medication that she was taking is um, Tylenol for the pain and some multivitamins, a B12 and a probiotic. So when I asked her about her appetite, it tends to be, it's more of a manda agni. She doesn't tend to feel very hungry. It's sort of irregular. In the morning, she feels really hu hungry. And in the rest of the day, it's not so much. So there was some irregularity. So not completely manda, more vishama. Um, she used to have acidity um, or hyperacidity a few years ago. She didn't have it, doesn't have it anymore. Um, her, her diet for the most part was really balanced and very well. She was she ate fresh cooked food and very light, easy to digest food. There are only certain things that she did like. She used to have... Um, you know, her breakfast and dinner was pretty good. For lunch, she tends to every day eat salads. Um, and she eats salads with uh, rice crackers. Um, sometimes she'll have soup. Sometimes she'll have a moong dal. Um, she doesn't eat, really drink um, tea all that much. Once in a while, no coffee. Eight to ten glasses of water per day. Uh, her bowel movements were fairly regular. She tends to have a bowel movement every day, um, not really constipated. For the most part, it was easy uh, for her to evacuate. Um, this, she never has any sticky bowels or any foul smell or anything like that. Um, no real signs of ama as such. Her immunity, she feels it wasn't the greatest she, see, she feels like she gets infections very quickly. Um, she says that her energy level is really low and she feels tired a lot. And she does do a little bit of exercise, um, but she sprained her ankle two months ago, so she hasn't been doing anything recently. She tends to generally feel cold. Um, she doesn't sweat a lot. And she doesn't really feel thirsty all that much, sometimes, occasionally, okay? Um, for, for her psychological profile, she says that she's very stressed. Her job is very stressful because actually she's a professor. So she was, she's very, she, you know, she, she has a lot of mental activity and she, for the past, when she came to me was about two months ago. Oh no, it was about a month ago. And um, it was, she was telling me about her situation of when it was the end of the semester and when she had a lot of stress. 
that was when she started feeling the headaches and the pressure in her head. And that's when she, just after that is when the symptoms started. Okay. Um, for the most part, her self-esteem is really good. She has good relationships. Um, and her sleep, her sleep wasn't all that great. She tends to go to sleep either at 12 or one o'clock in the morning. Um, and then she wakes up at around six o'clock in the morning. So didn't get that many hours, probably maximum around five to five and a half hours of sleep. Um, of course, when she wakes up in the morning, she feels really tired. And um, ideally, she would like to have around eight hours of sleep. Um, she has already completed her menopause, um, so she has no symptoms of that. She does have dry skin and... Um, and dry nails. And what she had also presented with when I first saw her was that on her right leg, around her ankle and the dorsal part of her foot, it was there was a lot of dry skin. It almost looked like eczema. Um, there was a lot of dry skin, and there wasn't too much of swelling at that time. But it was it was slightly there. It wasn't really too much, but it was very very dry. Okay. So she had a bit of that rash, that, that eruptions on her legs. And she said she had tingling sensation in her feet. Um, okay. So her, her prakriti was more sort of pitta um, kapha. That's kind of her prakriti. Not really vata in her prakriti because she was very soft-spoken, um, she would answer her questions very slowly and methodically, but, um, but she has a lot of stress in her life. Okay. So what impression that I got was definitely that she had this, this, um, very stressful time in her job. And it, that was really what was causing all of the Vata aggravation. And as you can see, she had a latent issue of Vata long before this even presented. She had the issue with the asthma and the breathing difficulty. She even had the issue with the UTI, with what she was saying that it's difficulty for her to pass urine, which again is indicative of vata because apana vata is what's responsible for the initiation of that urge. If apana vata isn't there or isn't doing that function, what usually happens is when it starts to move upwards, then that that tends to happen a lot, that it's not initiating the urge. And that's why if it's not initiating the urge, the urine sits there longer, therefore causes more frequent infections. Okay. So that was, and again, she said that she had arthritis in her neck and she also had that tingling sensation in her face. And that was around 10 years ago. It came and it went away. So she had all of these underlying issues with Vata that was there. Um, beforehand and then finally what happened was she had this stressful event at work that really helped to tip it off to the point where she ended up feeling the pressure so i think for her her situation wasn't really a stroke but it was that hypertensive um, encephalopathy that she, i think she fell under that category because she definitely was she was under a lot of stress and even i asked her if she had a high blood pressure but she said not really so much, you know, for the most part, it tends to be, um, it tends to be normal. Every now and then it tends to go high. So I think for her, it was, it was definitely that, that hypertensive encephalopathy because it was just that immediate onset of that extreme stress that aggravated her, her blood pressure that created that, um, that extreme pressure in her mind and her brain and, sort of can mildly burst some of the the small little capillaries or some of the small little arteries or can also help to block um the flow of vata okay so i even though she had a very mild version of pakshagada i still diagnosed it and, and understood it as pakshagada so what i had advised her to do was for for the first few days because since she didn't really have a very good appetite even though she didn't have any signs of ama if i when i checked her tongue her tongue was clear <coughs> so there weren't really much signs of ama but just the fact that her agni wasn't regular i did advise her to take trikatu um, for five days
And after that, I asked, asked her to, um, to start taking castor oil. So, um, so she did take the Thricatu <coughs> and, um, she was going to start taking, she started taking the castor oil, but then she got another one of the UTIs. <coughs> she got another one of the UTIs. So she ended up going on, um, an antibiotics for a couple of days for a course of seven days, I think. And then after once she, she stopped that, then she went back on the, um, the castor oil. I also gave her, um, uh, advised her to take Sahajaradi and the Shalaki liniment. So asked her to mix some of that and apply it on and do Abhyanga with that. So she was doing that and that did help quite a bit. So just yesterday I had a follow up with her and after one month, so she didn't get to take the medicines that I advised, but she did get to do those other things because I did advise her some other medicines. So after one month, of taking the castor oil intermittently and also taking the trikatu and applying just the sahajaradi and shalaki she said that the the pain in her shoulder has reduced um the pain the pressure in her head has reduced she went to the doctor to do a regular checkup and they said that they they're seeing now fluid in her ears not really anything too much to really worry about but they did see fluid in her ears her appetite is much better. Her bowel evacuations are much better. There, she's she's going out. She's able to pass her bowels very easily, and she's not really feeling bloated anymore. She used to have some bloating before, but it's much less now. Um, for the most part, that was good. But what she did notice was that now there's swelling uh, in in her legs. There is a little bit of swelling in her legs. There's swelling in the joints. And that rash is still there, but the rash is not as dry anymore. It tends to, it's a little bit more moist. So now it has changed from a very pure, uh, a vata condition where it's, it's stuck and it's not really moving, where the fluid is now releasing a little bit. It's moving, but it's not necessarily moving out as much as we'd want it to. So now I have asked her to, you know, continue. She does need to continue with the castor oil at night and i've also advised her to take um tiktaka kashaya and chandra baba vati so she's going to take the tiktaka kashaya and the chandra baba vati um twice a day before before breakfast and before dinner um so that's that's kind of what she's going to continue that now for for 25 days and then we'll check in again and see where she's at. But even with just taking the Thricatu and the application of the oil and taking the castor oil int intermittently, she still was able to get some relief um, of her symptoms. So ideally, we're still going to wait for her to take the, the, the formulas because those will be much more effective. But we are still able to get some, some change with, with just these mild versions of it okay so back to cerebral palsy can we we can't intervene because it's so long-standing condition versus uh an event blockage that produced the pakshagada sharp shooting pain no she didn't say her headache was a sharp shooting pain she said that she felt like it was pressure it wasn't a sharp shooting pain. She felt she she did exactly this. She put her hands on her head and she said, I just feel like there's so much pressure right here. I feel like my head's going to explode. Like that's that sort of headache she had. And she felt like it was throbbing, throbbing and it pressure, not not any sort of sharp pain. That's what she had described. Okay. So any other questions? For the for the case of the cerebral palsy, it's it's again it's really hard. Um, ideally, in those conditions where it's very long standing, that's actually when we would want to use the the metallic medicines. <laughs> so <laughs> here again, of course, that's our restriction. We can't do that, but um, 
in India, this is when we would want to use, we would want to try to use the um, metallic medicines. So if you want to know, I will tell you what the metallic medicines are that we use. Um, they are, wait, hold on a second, I have a list right here. Uh, one of the metallic medicines that we typically use for this is Ekanga Viras, um, because Ekanga Vira, uh, one of the other synonyms for this condition is Ekanga Ruga, which means Eka means one, Anga means your limbs, and Roga means disease. So it's a disease of one side of all your limbs on one side. So there is a medicine called Ekanga Viras which means you're able to conquer that one side with this formula. So that's one of the rasa oshadis or the metallic medicines that they use. And that does have mercury in it. Um, it has mercury and sulfur. Um, and I believe it has mica and silver. And let me see, I, I can tell you, I, I can look it up and tell you what the exact formula for that is. Another one of the, the typical um, condition, typical rasa um, oshadis that we use for this is um, vata vidhamsaras, which means it is, a, it is a combination that is specifically used for pacifying vata. Another one like that is vata chintamani ras. These are all um, metallic preparations that really help to immediately pacify vata, get vata moving downwards, and also um, to get to enhance the proper functioning of vata. And the thing with these rasa oshadis or these metallic medicines is for those, we don't necessarily need to check the person's agni or we don't necessarily need to prep them so much beforehand because they're very, very potent and we use only a very small quantity of it. But the way it is administered and how it is administered and the frequency is very specific. Um, if you don't do that properly, then it will definitely produce side effects. Okay. Okay. So um, this basically covers the, the topic of Prakshagada. I hope that I was able to cover uh, a bit of the the Western or conventional perspective, um, and of course, please feel free to let us know if you need um, if you have questions about that, or if you have if you need more information um, from the from the conventional aspect. Because I know that we didn't have enough time this weekend, and we did definitely miss Gerard and his expertise. Um, so, of course, if you do have any questions. Uh, we'll try as much as possible to be able to answer that or to refer to some of our other colleagues if you want to get the conventional perspective. I hope that I was able to at least pacify some of those curiosities that you may have. Um, and I have been trained in that, but of course my, ex my training is in nowhere in comparison to Gerard's training and his experience. So, um, I'll try, we'll try our best to be able to, to answer your questions for you. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you everyone and hope you all have a really good night. Thanks, Anusha. Thanks, Anusha. Have a great night. Thanks, Anusha. You too.